right? Chemical thermodynamics. So we've been talking about um, equilibrium and equilibria plural over the past several chapters. Um, one of the things that we we didn't you know thoroughly discuss is kind of some of the thermodynamics or the thermal energy that goes in to why these chemical reactions occur, um, why we have the you know distribution of equilibrium on one side or the other. We gave we just gave discussions about the equilibrium constants. But there's you know the there's more of a thermodynamic understanding as to what's going on. So when we talked about um, first law of thermodynamics, you know, recall back in chapter five that energy cannot be created or destroyed. Therefore, the total energy of the universe is a constant. Uh, energy can, however, be converted from one form to another or transferred from a system to the surroundings or vice versa. Right. So energy is basically a, always a constant, but it can exist in multiple forms. And this is when it comes to the discussion revolving around enthalpy and entropy. So enthalpy is the heat absorbed by a system during a constant pressure process, whereas entropy is a measure of the uh, randomness in a system. Right. So think about one is kind of a heat transfer. Enthalpy, we're talking about heat transfer. And we're talking, you know, this is constant pressure. Obviously, um, you know, heat transfer can, you know, exist under non-constant pressure. But what we're talking about here is, you know, you have, you know, heat transferred from, you know, through, a, you know, a, the, the container from, let's say, the water bath into your reaction vessel, right? You're, tr you're trying to warm up your reaction, you put it in a hot water bath, you have a heat transfer, right? there's, there's a constant pressure system. Whereas entropy, when we're talking about is the randomness in the system, it's think about how, you know, if you have a, you know, a cube of salt or sugar or, you know, any type of cube, right? When you place that into, uh, you know, water, you're going to watch it dissolve, right? The particles become more random. They go from an organized, you know, a cube to a less organized distribution of little, you know, individual particles spread throughout, you know, the solvent. So both of these play a role in determining whether a process is spontaneous or not, right? Spontaneous meaning that it just happens because the, you know, energy is favorable for it to happen. So we talk about a spontaneous processes. So spontaneous processes proceed without any outside assistance. And processes that are spontaneous in one direction are not spontaneous in the reverse direction, right? So don't confuse spontaneous with fast. There are fast and there are slow reactions that are spontaneous. And then don't confuse non-spontaneous with impossible. Energy can be used to make some reactions spontaneous that otherwise would not be, right? So they give you a picture of an egg over here on the right hand side, right? So you have, it, you know, you drop an egg, the egg drops to the ground and the egg cracks. All right? That's a spontaneous process, right? Gravity spontaneously pulls the egg towards the countertop and the egg breaks, right? But it's not going to be spontaneous in the reverse direction, right? It's not going, egg's not going to magically float back up into your hand and end up, uh, you know, reassembling itself, right? So that's what we're talking about here. And then, you know, the other thing is, you know, when you're thinking about a spontaneous process, so um, think of putting iron, uh, you know, a, a iron bar in water. It will spontaneously rust with time, right? You'll see rust will eventually happen. If you come back three days later, you'll start to see a coating of rust. But it's not a very fast process. It's a very slow process. You know, if you sit there for the first five minutes, you won't see anything happening. So it's a spontaneous process, but it's a slow process. Right. And that's what they're talking about. You know, when we're talking about the rates, rates are not to be confused with spontaneous spontaneity. 
So experimental factors affect spontaneous processes, right? So temperature and pressure can affect spontaneity. An example of how temperature affects spontaneity is ice melting or freezing, right? So if we have a, a vessel with ice you know, frozen here, at greater than zero degrees, it's going to spontaneously melt and become water, right? If we, that makes sense to all of us, right? It's a melting process. Whereas if we take this water and we bring it to below zero degrees, it's going to spontaneously freeze, right? And at no point in time, and this is just thinking about the reversibility, right? This reaction, at, at whenever you're below zero degrees, you're never going to have the ice spontaneously melt, right? It's impossible to go in the reverse direction. Just like conversely, if you're ever above zero degrees, you're never going to have water spontaneously freeze, right? These processes are never going to happen in the reverse directions in a spontaneous fashion. But in the four directions, it's a spontaneous process. So let's go through a kind of a sample problem here first. So it says predict whether each process is spontaneous as described and spontaneous in the reverse direction or it's at equilibrium. So if we have Take a look at water. Water at 40 degrees Celsius gets hot, hotter when a piece of metal is heated to 150 degrees Celsius. A piece of metal heated to 150 degrees Celsius is added. Right? If you think about what's going on here, right, this process is going to be a spontaneous process. Right? You, you have your flask, right, and you have your water it's sitting here at 40 degrees Celsius, and you place a metal rod into the flask. That metal rod is at 150 degrees. Uh, 150 degrees Celsius. Right, that metal rod is going to transfer its heat to the water, and you're going to have a spontaneous warming of the water occurring. Right. So basically, whenever two objects at different temperatures are brought into contact, heat is transferred from the hotter object to the colder one. Yeah, this makes sense to all of us. We see this happen, right? You know, you, you walk outside in the middle of the summertime, it's 95 degrees Fahrenheit out, you feel the heat transfer to your body, right? Or if you go out in zero degrees in the middle of winter, you feel the heat transfer out of your body. It's, this is, a, you know, easy to understand. So thus heat is transferred from the hot metal to the cooler water. Um, the final temperature, whoops, a little, Thing did get moved. The final temperature after the metal and water achieve the same temperature is known as the thermal equilibrium, right? We have an equilibrium, right? Will be somewhere between the initial temperature of the metal and water. So thermal equilibrium just means that we have, you know, we're going to have heat moving in and heat moving out of the system, you know, with the water. So you have water and you have your metal rod, and then you're going to have heat transfer back and forth between the two. And they're going to be left at a constant temperature, what somewhere in between 40 degrees and 150 degrees Celsius. All right, let's take a look at another system. Right? Water at room temperature decomposes into H2 and O2. Right? If you're sitting there and you have your flask, and there's water sitting in there, when was the last time that you saw hydrogen gas? Oops. That you saw hydrogen gas and oxygen gas bubbling out of your, your cup of water, right? You never did, right? So you know from an experience perspective, you've, you know, this is a not a spontaneous process, right? You never see hydrogen and oxygen bub bubbling out of your glass of water, right? So this is not a spontaneous process, you know? So you think about it from that perspective, Rather, the reverse reaction, right? If you take hydrogen gas, right? if you take H2, H2H2 plus O2, and we ignite it, we're going to form two water molecules, right? This is, uh, you know, just a very, you know, natural progression of, you know, you, you ignite hydrogen in the presence of oxygen, it burns, right? You think of the, um, the, uh, zeppelin that burned, right? you know, it was a hydrogen blimp. It ignited, it, it burned with all the oxygen. All right, so that's a spontaneous process. So the reverse process is spontaneous. 
but the process we're describing is not. All right, benzene vapor. So at a pressure of one atmosphere, it condenses to liquid benzene at the normal boiling point of benzene at 80.1 degrees Celsius. All right. So right now we're talking about we have a container, we have little particles, vapor particles of benzene, and you have it at 80.1 degrees Celsius, and it's one atmosphere of pressure. And you're gonna what you're gonna watch is these droplets are going to condense, right? These vapor particles are going to condense into a solution down here. Right? So this is obviously it's going to be a spontaneous process, right? You're at the uh, boiling point. You're it's spontaneous in the that downward direction, but it's also spontaneous in the evaporation because this is going to be because you're at the boiling point. You have an equilibrium that occurs, so it's spontaneous in both directions, so to speak. That's equal. We're going to be calling it an equilibrium-based process, right? So we're at equilibrium. In this liquid where we have evaporation and condensed condensation occurring at the exact same time because we're at the boiling point. Does that make sense? So that's one of the things that's a little different, right? Because we're, we have it happening in both directions. Um, so, you know, at equilibrium, we have, you know, evaporation and condensation occurring. If we went below 80.1 degrees Celsius, we would have just condensation, right? So it would be spontaneous condensation occurring. If we went above, oops, above 80.1 degrees Celsius, we would have spontaneous evaporation occurring, right? You, so you can see how um, the process is basically uh, at equilibrium because we're right at the boiling point. And if you think about this in terms of right, our reaction progress diagram, right? You would have, oops, actually go in the other direction in this case. Right, if we have temperature cooling and then at 80.1 degrees Celsius, right? So if we call this 80.1 degrees Celsius, right, you have your vapor here and then you have the liquid here. And the point we're talking at about is right here, right? This is the, the condensation. Slash vaporization. Right. This is the point at which condensation and vaporization occur, right? depending on which direction you're going. Are you adding heat or taking away heat? But this is the equilibrium that occurs, right? When you're in between the vapor phase and the liquid phase, when you're right at the boiling point, you have this condensation and vaporization that are occurring. So that's this is the equilibrium that's occurring here. All right. So this is going to be a little bit, this part's a little bit more abstract when we talk about reversible and irreversible processes. So a reversible process, we're talking about reversible process here, the system changes so that the system and the surroundings can be returned to the original state by exactly reversing the process. This maximizes the work done on the system, uh, done by a system on the surroundings. When we're talking about here, and this is the key for a reversible and irreversible process, the delta T or the change in temperature is just infinitesimally small, right? We have, an, we're talking about an infinitesimally small temperature difference that's occurring here, right? And so if we look at the pictures to understand what's going on. So we have our system, right? The system is in the, in the center here. It's at a higher temperature, right? Than this, the surroundings, you know? It's the temperature plus this infinitesimally small change in, you know, delta T. You know, you're going to have this increment of heat is going to be transferred from the system to the surroundings, right? So this arrow is showing you have an, you know, because there's an infinitesimally small higher temperature in the system, you're going to have this 
change that occurs where you can have heat transfer from the system to the surroundings. And conversely, if we look at the system on the right, right, the system on the right, where we have this infinitesimally small change that's slightly lower in temperature than the surroundings, you're going to have heat being transferred from the surroundings into the system, right? It's going to be, again, you have this infinitesimally small change that can occur. occur. And when, you, when we're talking about infinitesimally small changes in temperature, right, we have a reversible process, right? Because this transfer can occur where you have heat, it can be transferred to the external from the system or internally from the system to the you know, surroundings to the system. So when we're talking about reversible and irreversible processes, that's what we're talking about. This is a reversible process. So an irreversible process cannot be undone by exactly reversing the change to the system or cannot have the process exactly followed in reverse. Also, any spontaneous process is irreversible. So let's see what they mean here, right? So if we have a chamber here, right? You have your a vacuum on one side and you have your gas on the other. If we pull this partition out, right, we take this partition here and we remove the partition. We're, obviously, these gas particles are going to expand and fill the entire chamber. Right? So this partition, when the gas spontaneously fills the entire chamber, is not reversible, right? If we take and we push this partition back down into the chamber and reseal it, right? we're not going to reverse the process. This is irreversible, right? This is what we're talking about here. So the only, what we can do though, is we can place, you know, pressure or do work on the system by pushing in on this piston. And when we move the piston up to the point here and compress the gas back to its halfway point, we've done work on the system, right? You know, so the externally, the surroundings have has done work on the system and we have the system is now going to be have greater than zero you know amount of change in energy right because we basically added energy to the system in order to compress um, the gas back to its original size so you know what we're talking about here is an irreversible process right in order to get it back to its original you know state we had to do work on the system and that's what we're talking about for an irreversible process so again reversible process we have infinitesimally small changes that can occur that can be you know yeah can can occur naturally but it's going to be again infinitesimally small whereas irreversible in order to get it back to the original state, we have to do work or some some transfer of energy has to occur, occur from the surroundings back on the original system. All right. Let's see. All right. I'm sorry, the questions I just saw there. Sorry. Uh, says so. Would it be still be considered a spontaneous process? Oh, it's considered equilibrium. Sorry, Sophia. Yeah, it's an equilibrium. So there, because it's going in both directions. Oh, sorry, just saw your question. My little scrolly, unfortunately, sometimes for the chat doesn't stay down. All right. All right, let's move on to entropy. All right, actually, before we do that, let's, I think I actually have a sample problem that I forgot to walk through. Let's go through a sample problem here first. Right. 
So sample problems. So they're all posted on Canvas if you want the paper versions of these. All right, so let's go for the first problem. This is the process of iron being oxidized to make iron three oxide or rust is spontaneous. Which of these statements about the process is or are true? So you have to go through A through E and let me know which ones in the chat you believe are true, A through E. So take some time and go through to understand this. Give you all a chance to think about it. Still thinking. I give there are a few more people still working through. of answers and a bunch of people still sleeping I think there's not very many answers my class is half the size all right so if we're working through right So obviously, we know based on descriptions that the reduction of iron-3 is not going to be spontaneous if we're told that the forward direction is spontaneous, then the reverse direction cannot be spontaneous, right? It's only spontaneous in one direction. So I think everybody will agree that the first one is false. The second one, because the process is spontaneous, the oxidation of iron must be fast. Well, since I gave you that example, right, you know, it doesn't have to be a fast process, right? It's a slow process as long as it's going in the forward direction. It doesn't, the rate of the reaction doesn't make a difference, right? As long as it's uh, a process that's occurring in the forward direction, the rate has no relationship to spontaneity. So this is going to be false as well. I think most people got that. The oxidation of rust of iron is endothermic. So if you think about what this looks like, we have our reaction energy diagram. If we're starting at iron, we have an activation energy occur and an endothermic process would end up here. All right. 
So if this is an equilibrium, right, if we assume that there's an equilibrium process here, so we have pure iron here, and then we have iron oxide or rust there. So an endothermic reaction, right, we would have to, we would, you know, be increasing the amount of heat, right? So our delta H here is going to be a positive number, right? It's a positive number. Right. So if this was an equilibrium, you would expect that this, you know, the activation energy here is much larger than the activation energy here. So you'd expect that if it was an endothermic process, that this would proceed in the reverse direction, right? Because you'd have a lower activation energy. So you'd expect this process that it would need to be an exothermic process, right? And more than likely what's actually going on here is probably more along the lines of um, it's an endothermic process, but it's an endothermic process that has a really high activation energy, right? So you're, I mean, exothermic, not endothermic, exothermic. So you're giving off a delta H here but the activation energy is rather high, right? So our EA is high, which is why this process proceeds in a slow rate. Mm -hmm. uh, I said equilibrium and I don't, well, from, I guess what I, I meant to say, well, at any, if you, if you had, let me try to think about what I'm trying to say when I say the word equilibrium. Uh, so a, the chemical reaction, maybe equilibrium is probably a, a poor term and if we go back, if we go to the presentation, when we talk a lot of times when we're talking about equilibrium in regards to spontaneity, we're talking about um, temperature transfers. We're not usually talking about chemical reactions. So this is, I'm using um, chemical equilibrium as a different term than a equilibrium of temperature transfer. And so, and I guess that's, that's the one thing that we you have to take caution from, from this, this, um, for this particular system when we're talking about, we'll get into that when we talk about, you know, D in a second. So give me a second and we'll, it'll hopefully make more sense. Um, so. Give me one second when I see your questions about you know, equilibrium is spontaneity in both directions. But yes, so Sophia, the, the, uh, when we're talking about this, rust, rust is an exothermic process. It's exothermic, right? But we're talking about, uh, you know, from a reaction perspective, I draw the energy diagram here, but it probably looks something along the lines of like this, right? Where we have, I'm gonna erase this in a second, where you have this starting point and you go up and over reaction time down and you get this, you know, delta H that occurs here, right? Where you're giving off heat and it's, but the reaction time, the reaction prog progress diagram is over a long period of time. So the amount of heat that's being given off is a very slow. So you're not going to notice the heat being given off during a, a oxidation of iron, if that makes any sense. So even though it's exothermic, we're talking, you know, exothermic over, you know, hours slash days, not exothermic over, you know, seconds. So you're not going to feel the heat coming off when a, a iron 
rusts. Okay. Um, so oxidation of rust is false. So it's not an exothermic process. So when we're talking about equilibrium being achieved, so this process is reversible. So you you can achieve an equilibrium, right? You can have iron going to iron oxide, right? Oops, that's a three. That you can have iron going to iron oxide in a reversible process, right? If you have if you take the heat that's being exothermed or being released during this process and you seal it in a system, right? You can have this reverse process going in the opposite direction. And, you know, so what we have is this closed system. So we have this iron bar, we have oxygen, and we seal it in a container. And this container is so well insulated, right? We have this closed system, we have insulated it such that we have this imaginary, again, it's going to be imaginary and in reality, this can't exist. We have this imaginary system that exists where we seal in all of the heat that's being transferred in this process, this delta H. So the, the delta H, you know, the heat that's given off remains in here. So we, once we end up with iron oxide, right, we end up with iron oxide in there, that heat that's transferred in the reverse direction can then be added back into the system and go in the opposite direction. So this is when we reach kind of equilibrium, where some of the iron is being oxidized in the forward direction, and some of the iron oxidized is being reduced in the reverse direction. Right, so we have the rates are equal, right? Okay, imaginary system, but if we were able to create such a system, then this is the case where you have, um, you know, Uh, you know, um, a kind of a true, a true system where, where it's going to be true because we have energy being transferred in both directions. Uh, and, and this is, this is, I guess, going to be the true one. The last one is just the energy of the universe is decreased when iron oxi is oxidized to rust. Well, the energy of the universe, and we'll talk about that actually in a slide or two in more detail, is always going to be constant. So this is going to be a false statement. So, all right, let me get back to the slides. Any more questions here? Let me see if I'm in the right place. All right, let's talk a little bit about entropy. So entropy has been ignored up until now. Um, it's, you know, I've discussed it briefly in class in the past. Um, so entropy, which is designated by the letter S, it can be thought of as a measure of the randomness of the system. It is a state function, i.e. not a, a path function, right? So you're looking at the state before and after a system. Like what is the, when we're thinking of entropy, we're thinking about, you know, the change in entropy is what does the system look like at the end versus what does it look like at the beginning? Not how did it get there, right? And it can be found by heat transfer from surroundings at a given temperature. So when we're talking about entropy, we'll talk about what this means in a second, but we're, um, when we have this heat being transferred from the surroundings at a given temperature, so we have some set temperature and, you know, the letter Q, so hopefully everybody remembers Q, 
Oops, why does it do that? Letter Q. Now we're talking about this is heat. And the heat that's being transferred from the surroundings, right? So we have our, our internal system and you have the surroundings, right? So the heat that's being transferred in is going to be heat in the reverse direction, right? Because this is not the heat being given off by the system, it's being the heat being put back into the system, so it's the reverse direction. And so that we can calculate that and our change in entropy is going to be equal to the heat. And this will uh, make more sense, and I'll describe what, what this means over the next couple slides, why, why we can set these equal to each other. And, but if we think about, we talked about the enthalpy of a system, right? If we think about enthalpy of fusion, right? If you have a, um, you have your system here, and let's say we had a liquid water and we were freezing it, right? If we were removing, removing heat from the system, then we have a, you know, based on the certain number of moles that exist, then we would have, uh, yeah, you like the dog? I would like to sh strangle my little doggy right now. I should say my wife's dog. Um, <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, where was I? So we have the heat of fusion, right? Heat of fusion is kind of the freezing process, the enthalpy that's being given off from freezing. We have a certain number of moles of the system that is going to be the amount of heat, right? The heat that's being transferred. So we can calculate our heat, right? Heat is just equal to the, you know, enthalpy change based on the number of moles for a particular substance. And that's going to be, again, all at constant temperature. So the you know, heat in the reverse, Q reverse, is the heat that would be transferred if the process were reversible, right? This is assuming a reversible process, right? We have a constant temperature, so there's no temperature change, so we should be able to see this yeah, transfer and heat occurring. Um, so when we're talking about entropy, um, again, it's a little bit more abstract, but let's just say we were all, um, if you're trying to understand what the change in entropy was, if we could measure how random a system was. So let's say the entire class, we were all sitting in, you know, picture yourself back in the classroom, and you're all sitting on the one side of the classroom. You know, everybody's, you know, sitting in one side. You know, it's a very organized system, right? So we have everyone sitting there, we have our classroom, and everyone's sitting all on one side of the classroom. Right. So this is organized, and that's the initial. If we then look at a random system, where everyone just suddenly gets up and walks around to wherever they want to be, and you have right the you know before and after. So our s final, right, and versus our s initial, you can see that our change in randomness, in this case, we're seeing an increase in randomness that occurs, right? When we go from final, you know, from initial to final, we have this increase in randomness that occurs. And that's what we're talking about from entropy, right? So this, it's easier and you feel more comfortable, so to speak, right? If you're move and you, you know, everybody stands separate from one another. So this, you know, you have this increase in entropy that occurs. If you know, I then, you know, um, I don't know, you have, you start a fire over on the side of the room over here, right? You're all going to take the energy and you're going to run in the reverse direction to the other side of the room, right? Because, you know, you're going to use energy, you know, you have this fire over burning on one side of the room and you're going to use energy to then reverse the process, right? So it's, you know, you have a decrease in the randomness that occurs. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about entropy. All right. 
I didn't animate that improperly. All right, so let's go through another sample problem. Um, calculating delta S for a phase change. So elemental mercury is a silver, silver liquid at room temperature. Its normal freezing point is minus 38.9 degrees Celsius. It, and its molar enthalpy of fusion is, so delta H of fusion is 2.29 kilojoules per mole. What is the entropy change of the system when 50 grams of mercury as a liquid freezes at the normal freezing point? And then we give us the atomic weight of mercury is 200.59 grams per mole. Right, so let's go through this sample problem. So first recognize that freezing is an exothermic process, right? Which means that heat is transferred from the system to the surroundings, right? So heat is going to be greater than zero, right? Because we have, right, you have your mercury sitting here as a liquid. In order for this to freeze, you have to remove, you know, heat from the system, right? Heat has to be removed. Because freezing is the reverse of melting, the enthalpy change that accompanies freezing of one mole of mercury is the delta H of fusion, right? So the delta H of fusion is what's what we're talking about here, right? The, you know, delta H of fusion is minus 2.29 kilojoules per mole. So we're taking, sorry, a little negative sign is over here on the right hand side. We're taking the negative delta H of fusion because we have a process where the, um, it's kind of the reverse of melting, right? So we have heat being given off, that's a negative. So we're gonna use ne negative delta H of fusion and the atomic weight of mercury to calculate the heat for freezing 50 grams of mercury. Right, so we have our delta H of fusion. We need to calculate the number of moles, right? We have 50 grams, we have the atomic weight, we can calculate our number of moles right, because we have our units here for fusion are in kilojoules per mole. So we're simply going to be plugging it in. We, we know the temperature that this is going to occur at, right? It's going to occur at a constant temperature of 38.9 degrees Celsius, minus 38.9 degrees Celsius. So it's just simply a matter of plugging in for first to calculate the heat, right? So we calculate heat first. And in order to do that, we need to again, calculate our number of moles. So 50 grams times the inverse of the molar mass gives us the number of moles that we then multiply by the delta H of fusion. Right, delta H of fusion here is minus 2.29 kilojoules per every mole. We need to, and we're going to convert over to kilojoules. I mean, from kilojoules to joules. So we end up with minus 571 uh, joules of heat, right? Minus 50, 571 joules of heat is being transferred during this freezing process. So if we then, um, first, we need, first thing we need to do is we need to recognize that our, we need to convert our Celsius over to Kelvin so we convert Celsius to Kelvin. So we have first the temperature change. The temperature that we're running this at is 234.3 Kelvin. And then we look at the entropy of our system, right? We just simply do the math, right? Where we take the heat in the reverse direction and divide it by the temperature in Kelvin and we end up with a minus 2.44, minus 2.44 joules per Kelvin as a ent entropy change in our system. Why is Q also the Q reverse? Oh, so we specifically um, calculated Q here as the, you know, the heat of the system, we were specifically calculating Q reverse here. Uh, the V is in the forward direction. If we, we look at delta H of, you know, the delta, the, we, I guess in this particular case, we were calculating Q reverse. So we were, we were calculated, even though we label this as Q reverse here. 
um, where specifically this, what we really calculate here was Q reverse. Um, give me one second here. Um, I don't know if that the the calculation that we were doing here was specifically oops let me do that was specifically to calculate Q reverse and we just call it the heat. Um, trying to think of how I'm trying to explain this. So the heat in the system, you know, you wouldn't there isn't a, an equation for you know Q Q reverse heat in reverse direction. Right, there is just a calculation for heat, and in this particular case, the heat that we're calculating here is the heat in the reverse direction. I don't know if that makes sense. All right. So to a quick check, so the entropy change is negative because our Q reverse value is negative, which it must be because the heat flows out of the system in this exothermic process. Their comment, um, the procedure can be used to calculate delta S for other isothermal phase changes, such as the vaporization of a liquid at its boiling point, right? So we could also look at the, you know, instead of using delta H of fusion, we could use delta H of vaporization, right? So we could do the exact same thing and, you know, talk about vaporization or condensation as well. All right. So let's work through another sample problem. Click here. All right. Next question says, do all exothermic phase changes have a negative value for the entropy change of the system? So you have A through E. So take the time, answer the question. It says, do all exothermic phase changes have a negative value for the entropy change of a system? Let's see if I can blow this up. Take the time, and when you have an answer, place it in the, in the, the chat. silent half of the class. Half of the class makes no peeps. All right. So an exothermic phase change, right? So when we're talking about exothermic phase change where we have, you know, some type of system, and in this system we have 
and exotherm, so that means heat, right? We have heat is going to be being exchanged to the surroundings, so heat is going to be greater than zero. So when, whenever this, is, this happens, right, we think about the entropy, right? The entropy in that system. So the amount of randomness that occurs has to go down. So here's, right, we have in the beginning, and we think about, we have little gas particles, right? We have gas particles. Each of these gas particles is moving around very rapidly, right? moving around rapidly, there's a rapid change, but we're going through a phase change. And at the end, we end up with a liquid. Right. Right. So the heat is being transferred out of the system, right? When we condense our vapor, we have to take heat out of the system, right? If you had water droplets floating inside of the this sealed container, in order to make these water droplets into a liquid, we needed to. We would need to cool down the system. Right? We would have to remove heat. And as you can see, what happens to the entropy? What happens to the randomness? Right? The entropy. You know, we have this decrease in entropy that occurs. Right? So that the delta s, right, our delta s, our entropy that's occurring, is, uh, you know, where you're going to have a heat transfer out of the system. Right? When the heat, I mean, sorry, you're going to have um, a negative value that's occurring here, right? Because we're seeing this de decrease in entropy, right? The randomness is now we have a much more organized system. Our liquid water is more organized. It's sitting down in the bottom of the vessel. So we have our decrease in entropy. So we're going to have a negative number for entropy after at, after this change occurs, right? So and what was B says, yes, because the temperature decreases during the phase transition. So phase transitions, right? If we recall in our energy diagrams, right? The phase transition that's occurring here has a constant temperature. So our temperature stays the same. So there's no change in temperature in a phase transition. So there's no, B is not going to be true. Um, so it's going to have to be A here. So obviously, uh, so and C, when we're thinking of C, it says the entropy change depends on the sign of the heat transfer to or from the system. Well, in this case, we have our heat is being transferred out, so it's a positive number, and the entropy is being trans, you know, is being decreased, so it's a negative number. So they're in the opposite directions. So C is not correct, and then D, no, because heat transferred to the system has a positive sign, right? We actually have heat being transferred out of the system, not into the system, so that's not going to be correct either. Right, so obviously then E is not correct. So anybody have any questions? Oh, sorry. It's a long question here. Since delta S depends on the final minus the initial, if the temperature did decrease, wouldn't it make Q over T a negative? Um, No. All right, if you go, let me go back to that. Right, so if you think about, right, so just think about what the formula is. If you have Q over RT, right, a, a decrease in temperature does not make this number negative, right? Because, you know, you, let's just say you go from, you know, 298 Kelvin and you have a 
you know, going, you're decreasing to, I don't know, to 100 Kelvin, right? This is still going to be a positive number. Right, so your your temperature is not going to go negative. It's the heat, the direction that the Q is going to be either positive or negative. The temperature is not. Does that make sense? From mathematical perspective. Um, let me think about, uh, there is, where is it? Um, let me go back to the slides and show you something. So there is a caveat that's built into are the slides here. Let's go back here. Let's go and where is it? Go back there. Not too far. Where did I go? There's a caveat built into. I must have skipped it. Where is it? Okay into when we're talking about entropy you know the other part that's built in is we're using it at constant temperature so we're talking about the heat transfer from the surroundings where we're talking about constant temperature you know entropy is going to be related to this heat when we're talking about constant temperatures so that's the other part there is a temperature component when we're talking about systems. When we get to free energy, Gibbs free energy, it, you know, the temperature component that you're talking about will make a little bit more sense. We're talking about the overall energy of the system. Right now we're talking about um, kind of just entropy alone and its relation to heat. We'll get there. So we'll talk a little bit about the second law of thermodynamics. So um, the entropy of the universe increases in any spontaneous process. So when we're talking about a spontaneous process, um, this re results in the following relationships. So if we have a reversible process, right, any reversible process, the entropy of the universe is going to be equal to the entropy of the system plus the entropy of the surroundings, which is going to be equal to zero, right? So if we have a reversible process, so any, any system that we talked about, you know, remember where we have these infinitesimally small changes that occur, and you can have the infinitesimally small change where the heat is being transferred in, or you can have, you know, the transfer outwards or inwards infinitesimally small changes so a reversible process you know the overall entropy of the universe is going to be equal to zero we're talking about irreversible process the entropy of the universe is going to be greater than zero so what does this mean so think about you know very abstractly right the all of the randomness that's occurring in the universe Right, will be become much more random during an irreversible process. So if you have a stick of dynamite, that dynamite is very organized and you know a, a stick, it explodes. Right, that explosion is you know even though your surroundings you know your surroundings are going to be disrupted, the system itself is going to become much more random the you know 
organized pile of dirt that it was sitting in. Yeah, it was now, now no longer organized. So you have this you know, irreversible process. You have this increase in the overall disorder of the universe, an increase in, so irreversible. All right, that's what we're talking about here. So whereas in a reversible process, that's, you know, you're not going to have that, right? Something that you're, you're entropy, you know, if you have this system, right? The system transfers some of it, you know, energy to the external, right? That since it's reversible, since it's infinitesimally small, that reversal can occur in the opposite direction as well, right? So you can have it go in or out. And thus, you're going to have no change in the overall disorder of the universe. All right. Let's see. Yeah, one minute left. Um, I think we'll we'll stop there. I actually have to look because it looks like this slide is all messed up with the numbers down below. So we'll stop here and um, pick up during the next class. Hopefully everybody has a good weekend. Uh, have a uh, good feast day on Sunday. Um, so enjoy. Hopefully everybody has a good Easter season, continues with a good Easter season. Everything goes well. Relax a little bit. We're in the final stretch. A couple more weeks left. See you later, everyone. <laughs>